Um, can I welcome the panel to our first hearing on our science communication inquiry. Um, we are trying to understand a little bit more um, about public engagement with science and how we can do a better job about um, spreading excitement about science. Um, and we felt that Boaty McBoatface was a very good place to start. Um, I have been sent various good um, recommendations of first questions to ask, um, lots of them involving nautical puns. And so um, I think that the first question that I'd like to start with um, would come to you, Professor Wiggum, um, and it would be, do you think that the Minister is proud of NERC's work here, or do you think that he's going to make you walk the plank? Sorry, I didn't, I, I, sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Do you think that the Minister is proud of NERC's work? In, in public communication here? Or do you think that he's going to make you walk the plank? Well, I would like to think that he sees this as, as what I would describe as just an incredible success. We, um, we could make the claim that we're probably now the best known research council in the world. We could make the claim that because of that there are hundreds of thousands of people, not only in the UK but around the world, who now not only know about us, but know about the science that we've done. We know that we have attracted extraordinary attention, as indeed, for example, have the makers of the ship. And in many, many ways, we feel that this has just been uh, an astonishingly great outcome for us. Um, in addition, it's put a smile on everybody's face. So I would hope that the Minister, I can't put words in his mouth of course, but I would hope he would regard it as a very successful outcome for the activity that we started upon a few months ago. And what are your immediate plans to build on the awareness that's been um, developed through this poll? Obviously there's been a connection with a lot of groups who wouldn't ordinarily connect with science, particularly with polar research ships. So what are your plans to not just maintain those connections, but deepen those connections into uh, an interest in the science and not just the name of the boat? So we, um, I think we, we came actually to think about this because um, last year we decided to bring the discovery one of our blue water vessels up the Thames uh, to London as a way of, um, I don't know, materialising actually our science. And that of itself, though we moored the ship um, alongside the Belfast, and that of itself created enormous interest uh, in London. And we, so we came to the view that our ships are enormous draws and enormous way, marvellous ways of materialising that the science that we, that we do in a completely recognisable way. And it was with that in mind, actually, that we came to the view that we should maybe survey public views actually more widely as to how to name our new vessel. So we certainly, we certainly wish to continue with that, and indeed we now have plans to bring either the Discovery or, or the James Clark up the Mersey in October. We try and con we'll try and coincide that with the keel laying of the, of the new ship again to try and bring material attention to first of all our ships but then all the science that we do. The other thing that has been very clear from the response that we have had is that we are engaged entirely through boat at boat face it's true but we have engaged with a great deal of young folk who otherwise wouldn't have known about us or the Antarctic or the science that we do I think we'd very much like to think about how we can continue an engagement with that younger group of people. And that is why, for example, we are very keen to continue the name, albeit on a smaller vessel. We received um, a number of tweets um, in response to our announcement um, that we were going to be um, having this hearing today. Um, and one in particular caught my eye. It was that the vote brought this vessel to my attention. I do STEM outreach to year six and year eight and will be using it as a career example. This was from Robert Gissing. And um, I wonder if you're thinking about putting together any lesson plans and working with the teaching profession to make sure that this is a way to um, improve STEM teaching um, in any way. I think that um, 
It's fair to say that the, the primary role of a research council in its public engagement is at, I would roughly say, at a high level. But as you know, the Minister has announced a million pounds to beef stem around the whole issue of polar science. That, of course, for us is a very nice outcome. And what I think we'll be trying to do is to feed our understanding and our knowledge to the extent that it's needed into that activity in order to build that kind of uh, connection with the younger and the teaching community. So Professor Wilsden, um, we ran a highly scientific Twitter poll um, to try and establish um, whether Boaty McBoatface was a PR triumph or a disaster and 71% um, out of 109 respondents said that it was a triumph. Um, what's your assessment? Yes, well far be it from me to, to counteract the, the views of the, the public. No, I, I would agree with that. I think it has been a, a a good exercise. It's been very positive for NERC, as, as Duncan says. Um, and uh, I think the, the eventual decision that was reached on, on the name was a, a very elegant uh, compromise that it would be very hard for anyone to, uh, to object to. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's good. Um, the question, of course, is how you build on it uh, and also how you recognise its place in the broader uh, ecosystem, if you like, of uh, science communication, public engagement with science. Um, because uh, great as this is, and, and you know, I, I say I, when I first saw it, I laughed. I, I voted for voting vote, vote, vote face myself. Uh, but it isn't. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it isn't. It isn't a sort of substantive topic for public engagement. I mean, in the sense, if you ask a fairly superficial, low stakes question, you'll get uh, a different type of public engagement, a different type of public response from. Uh, the more serious, more substantive questions that the research councils sometimes need to engage the public in. Um, and, you know, there are many examples of this uh, from NERC's own past. Uh, I was involved a few years ago in work they did on geoengineering the climate. There's one very controversial area of, of uh, environmental or climate technology. Um, but we need to sort of place this in that hierarchy. You know, it's a sort of first order type of communication engagement. There are a sort of second order types which could include the kind of uh, engagement with schools that you're talking about um, and then there's sort of third order much more substantive more uh, contested areas of, of uh, public debate about the direction of science the direction of technologies uh, where we're not necessarily just uh, you know selling the good news we're also raising often quite difficult uncomfortable questions choices dilemmas that attach themselves to particular trajectories of research and you know a good research council a good research system should do all of those things and indeed you know the remit of this inquiry should I hope cover all of those things. So how do you make sure that you have a coherent system that first of all captures the interest and the imagination as I think this competition has but then retains that interest and makes sure that when the more difficult questions come along um, you already have that captured audience? What, what, what are the key um, features of such a system? Well, I think we have to start by acknowledging quite how, how far and fast we've travelled on this agenda over the last 15, 20 years. I mean, we've come from a, an era 25 years ago where we talked in, in somewhat patronising terms about public understanding of science through a kind of shift towards uh, dialogue with the public, more of a two-way conversation that uh, uh, was in large part the result of... of uh, the difficulties that were experienced around BSC, GM crops, etc. Um, and uh, we've now got this incredible, diverse, uh, largely bottom-up environment in which science communication and engagement takes place uh, on social media, uh, in pubs, on YouTube, uh, and obviously in the, in the formal media as well. So it's, you know, it, it's fantastic. There's a richness uh, to all of that that was unthinkable uh, even you know, 15, 16 years ago when I first became involved in science policy. So you know, all of that's great, um, but as I say, it needs to be accompanied then by more um, structured approaches to public dialogue on, on some of the trickier issues that are also part of that landscape. And again, here we've got lots of uh, good work to build on. The, the government's funded uh, things like the ScienceWise programme over the last 10 years now, 12 years, uh, which has done lots of uh, interesting often smaller scale deliberative work to try and tap into social intelligence, tap into public attitudes, values, uh, at a point in the research cycle where those, uh, you know, that intelligence can help to inform policy agendas, can help to inform uh, the, the decisions taken by funders and by regulators. Um, so we need more of that kind of stuff as well, uh, and in that way we can build up a, a, you know, a, a richer system. 
Um, and again, I mean, I think in terms of the timing of this inquiry, if we look at the sorts of changes that are being envisaged now in the organisation uh, of our research funding system, which will of course include NERC uh, within uh, that sort of reshaping of, of the landscape uh, linked to the nurse review and, and other measures in the white paper to come. You know, it's, it's a good point at which to ask questions about how we organise this stuff, at what level we run engagement, we think about communication, we think about dialogue, and just to make sure we really are building this stuff in properly to, to, to the new systems as they come into, uh, into existence. Thank you very much. Matt Warman. Um, thank you. I mean, obviously, we sort of touched on this. It is quality rather than quantity that you're interested in in terms of engagement up to a point, isn't it? So how many people have been engaged by this uh, programme and how, much, how many of those are you still in contact with? So there's a range of ways we can measure um, engagement and reach. Um, so if you look at sort of media coverage, which is a very light touch engagement, then we've had more than 250 million reach in the UK in print and online media alone. So that's not including the broadcast coverage or the international pieces. Um, more than half a million people actually took action by visiting the website that was set up just for this purpose. And then we're using the Twitter statistics. We had about 23 million people were reached using our hashtag, which was the Name Our Ship hashtag, whereas 214 million Twitter users, which is a very high proportion of Twitter users, were reached using the Boaty McBoatface hashtag. So we know that on that light touch, we've reached a large number of people with awareness. In terms of being able to evidence that we've actually had longer term engagement with them, we've seen a growth in all our social media followers, for example, but also we released some videos on YouTube that contained a minute and a half's worth of content each on science and the building of the vessel at Camel Aird. And we had 60,000 people viewed at least a minute's worth of that content. So we're looking to build as much as we can an ongoing connection to people using Boaty and the new name of Attenborough for the ship. But I think we've got evidence that they did get real science, not just fluff. Um, and it's like how, do, how does that compare to campaigns that you or others might have run before of a similar ilk? This has been wildly more successful than most of the campaigns we've run before. We were targeting 2 million Twitter users and we got 20 odd with just our hashtag and 200 odd with Boaty. In media coverage, we were looking to get a couple of good national hits, and we ended up getting very broad coverage, not just in the science media, but in the mainstream news media, and then in light entertainment shows. So we were on Gogglebox, Ant and Deck, Jonathan Ross, all sorts of places where science wouldn't normally be discussed. And if you extend that to the 60,000 that have uh, watched the videos and obviously gone a bit deeper, how, how would that compare to videos you might have put up before? That is a lot more than we normally get. We normally get a few thousand. So it seems unlikely that uh, science engagement is going to surpass 250 million people uh, for one issue in the next few years, uh, next, certainly in the next few months. But what re is, is this, and, you, and Professor Wilson touched on this, is this a case of sort of ask, ask a trivial question and get a load of trivial answers and you're never going to get anywhere near the majority of those people who have been engaged. So it is, in that sense, not really an exercise in scientific engagement. It is simply an exercise in humour for the vast majority majority of people? I think you'd be correct that some people it is just the humour and they haven't really touched any of the broader content but I think science engagement is a question of frequent contact with people and this has made science engagement something that happened in their normal everyday lives it became part of pub quizzes and discussions at car boot sales um, so it's reached them uh, them being the wider publics in their own terms, rather than in a sort of formal sense coming from a particular route saying, you must do it this way. Do you, do you envisage NERC running another competition to name a boat? We don't have any more ships planned just now, <laughs> but I would do it again. Um, the Australian Antarctic Division is currently uh, running a, a thing to, uh, to name its uh, Australian Polar Research uh, Vessel. What, what advice would you give them? <laughs> well, we did learn a few lessons. <laughs> Um, first of all, we learned to be prepared to overachieve. We didn't expect <laughs> to go viral. We were actually started out more concerned about not getting engagement. Um, so being ready to, to go viral will be something I am always prepared for in future, <laughs> not necessarily expecting that I can produce on demand. Um, there were some procedural things like moderating the submissions before they were published was very important. Out of 32,000 submissions, we eventually put 7,000 of them public. 
So there was a lot of work removing duplicates mm. or ones that were perhaps in, in less good taste. Um, and so in terms of capitalising on the, on the boat itself and the, and the submarine, um, is it going to be jammed full of all sorts of clever multimedia stuff so that we can still see what, what Boaty is doing and what, what Attenborough is doing? Have you sort of thought about how you might capitalise on it practically in that sense as well? Yes, we're going to go as far as we can with that practically. Um, we're still designing the vessel at the moment. So, uh, and we've had a lot of offers from people who are interested in working in new ways that now we get a bit of quiet, we'll be able to consider in the sort of cool lighter day. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair. Full disclosure that I have uh, written papers. I think James and I have been both in different magazines when I was the former Deputy Director of Involve. So I come at this from a slightly different perspective, which is a concern about the terminology and the difference between engagement, participation and awareness. So one of the things I think it'd be really helpful to understand from you is what metrics you set for all three of those categories, i.e. the difference between people perhaps being aware of boating at boat face, the difference of people engaging in the competition, and then actually the difference in people participating in scientific activities and engagement as a result of that being a gateway to involvement. So say so your three categories were... Awareness, engagement and participation because they're not all the same no, no and no. it's just interesting to hear obviously one of the big concerns is always that bad involvement is worse than no involvement at all I just wonder if you can unpick for us those three categories so like you say you had all these hits then does that translate in people actually taking part in the competition and where does that then lead to participation actually in scientific discussion inquiry endeavour which is obviously what you're trying to do so on the awareness levels, that's the easier thing to measure, um, mm -hmm. particularly with social media, you can reach sort of, you can measure how many people were talking about you or your topics. Mm -hmm. And so we did get very good metrics on that. And um, I'm not sure whether you were in the room when we covered those. I said that we'd had, uh, we targeted two million people yeah, yeah, for our Twitter. Twitter. Yeah. 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 So on social media and media coverage, it's very easy to reach and say, well, we made people aware in terms of levels of engagement, then we can look at the actions people took. So we can look at how many people visited the website, which didn't exist before that mm -hmm. campaign, so it was specific. How many people looked at the videos? How many people came to NERC's website, so our own traffic spiked? How many people wrote to NERC? We had about 2,000 emails directly on this topic, uh, as well as phone calls. Mm -hmm. So we can look at the sort of engagement levels there. We don't have statistics on what I would call good evaluation of participation as a result of this. We have a lot of anecdotal data that people talked about this with their families, with their children, that it was a discussion point, that they've done other things as a result. But we didn't set out to achieve what, that. What sort of other things? Um, we have people who've been talking about the work NERC does more widely with their friends and family. We've had families write in. Um, we've got a quote about a dad called Darren phoned us and said he and his children had never heard of the ship or the research council, but now that they were talking about the research that's done in Antarctica because of boating at boat face. Okay, so that to me would be an example of engagement rather than participation. I just wonder, obviously, uh, Matt was talking about have you got plans for more media, more participation for people in what the boat's actually doing? I just want to tease out a bit more what plans you've got for using that interest that you have generated in the boat and NERC to actually get people into science and actually participating in scientific endeavour and whether that's been part of the project that you planned or it was just the kind of naming the boat? I think it's, it's fair to say at the outset that our main focus was to, to bring focus onto the, this new ship mm. and also to, to simply ask for views about what her name should be. So it, it wouldn't it, we did wish to engage the public. Now what we have now is a different situation of really quite marvellous success and so we are only really now starting to address these longer term questions of how now do we build on that and sustain and sustain that that level of interest so um, there's no question that there is a very high level of interest and I'm one of, one of our reasons to want to retain the name on one of our vessels is that that allows us for example every time we launch her to bring a new renewed focus and we can use that for example as a platform for the science that maybe it will be performing at that time. 
So I think it's just, I'm just making these observations. This is a very short period of time over which to really seek evidence of what you're describing as participation. Yes, I mean, this, this um, speaks to the point I was, I was making about the different sort of levels of, of participation engagement in, in research agendas. And uh, uh, as I said at the start, I mean, I, you know, I think what NERC have done with the name process is, is, is great. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I think it's had, had uh, largely positive effects. How uh, sustained or, or deep they are is, is, is obviously something that's uh, uh, hard to measure and being realistic, probably a lot of that interest will dissipate as the you know agenda moves on. Um, but there are things they can do. I think the stuff they, they're going to try and do around um, links to, to schools and, and young people is, is a great idea. Um, as I say, I mean, what I really want to see our research councils, NERC included, taking seriously that, that sort of layering, that spread of activities, and thinking a bit more deeply about which techniques in respect of communication and engagement are more relevant to, to different research agendas. Um, and, you know, I think we've kind of shifted in this debate. There was a period in the early part of, of, of the last decade because of things like GM where this stuff was very high on the, on the kind of mainstream science policy agenda. Um, there was a very tangible sense in which, uh, uh, you know, public debate in the way it had played out had, had proved... Uh, deeply problematic in, in, in certain key areas. Um, and I think a lot of that sort of urgency around this debate has, has sort of drained away. Um, and it would be a great shame, I think, if we, we had to wait for the next sort of fiasco to push it back up uh, the agenda. Um, as I say, I think in the UK we've got great experience in this area. Um, Stella knows from direct experience. Um, we've, you know, we are viewed around the world as one of the leaders in science communication in public engagement in science. Uh, I think as, as you look at the research system as a whole, you know, spending just under £5 billion a year of taxpayers' money on research, taking seriously a strand of work that uh, tries to engage in all of those different types of communication, engagement, and more participative, more deliberative dialogue is really, is really important. So, I mean, to, to take a specific example linked to uh, uh, the, the boat, the ship, um, you know, one area that where you could have really substantive public dialogue are, is, is around the links between uh, polar research, diplomatic agendas, and uh, business agendas. Um, not to, you know, say anything NERC has done or hasn't done is, is right or wrong in that domain, but it wasn't very long ago where you had NERC publications talking about their role in helping to de-risk uh, some of these regions in terms of oil and gas exploration, uh, and that understandably raised issues with people who worry about climate change and worry about, worry about environmental agenda. So, you know, that's a, an example of a substantive area in which this stuff plays in. You know, the research that's going on is an important part of it, but there are also deeper social, political, ethical questions that merit some form of, of public engagement and, and which I think a research council should undertake. Just then on that point, because obviously what you're talking about is upstreaming, is essentially... Yeah using this interest to start conversations with people about possibly contentious issues and do it in a transparent way. The challenge though then that in this instance ultimately the decision making ability was taken away from the public because you did intervene and say actually no we're going to, to call it this instead of the original format. Do you think that impacts on the ability to then get people to take part in this is a less contentious area than pay something like GM foods or the crop development? And if we're talking about upstreaming, the concern about getting people involved is them understanding what power they do have to influence what the vote does, from what it's called to where it goes, to what research it does, how that research is used. Yes, I mean, I think the, the, the nature of engagement in this case was, was fairly well understood. People realised they were voting on a name, and uh, I don't think most people would have expected much more to have flowed from it than that. But, but yeah, if you're looking across the research... Uh, portfolio as a whole within an individual research council or the you know the, the UK research system. Absolutely, you need to be identifying those areas where. But they were given the idea that they were going to vote for something, and the thing that they did vote for didn't happen. <coughs> well, I think that so the, the fine print of the rules. Then. Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, I think I think the, the, the 
was always left slightly open that, that there would be a, an eventual decision, you know, taken um, uh, sort of irrespective of the weight of, of, of public votes. Um, I mean, I think, as I say, the, the, the name they've come up with is one that it's very hard for many people to object to, given David Attenborough is obviously a national treasurer, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they've kind of retained the, the Boaty McBoatface name elsewhere. So I'm not sure... You know, for me, I think this particular thing is 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 great in and of its own terms. I really hope, and I'm sure NERC will uh, build on that in various interesting ways. Uh, as I say, I'm just in, a, in an encouraging and constructive way, encouraging them to go that bit further and think a bit harder about some of the more tricky areas around which they might want some of the sort of deeper modes of engagement that you're talking about. Okay, thank you, Jim Dowd. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Um, you know, just, um, in response to the Chair's question about whether this was a public relations triumph and, or disaster, I'll leave aside whether you should treat those two impostors just the same, was it not a victory for trivialisation more than anything else? Or do you just take the view that any publicity is good publicity? Um, I, don't, I don't think this is a question of trivialisation. I think we can see very, very clearly in much of the press coverage and media coverage we got, that it's called, that although Boaty McBoatface was the tagline that took the story around the world, we can see time and time again evidence of people reading about the road, reading about the science, and learning much more about what we do. I, I myself am quite relaxed about the idea that, that people should have come at that in that way. So. Um, I don't. I don't really see it as a uh, as an either or issue. I think it's one that has been benefit all round. So you do take the view that any publicity was good publicity. I don't think it was any publicity. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. Well, let, let's move on then. What um, were there any conditions on the government's granting of the two hundred million for the? Uh, research vessel uh, to undertake uh, public engagement and what beyond the naming plans I know you've answered part of this already your colleagues have answered part of this already what other plans do you have to continue uh, public engagement other than around what Booty McBoface is doing this week um, sorry the, the conditions did the government put any conditions on the, the grant of the 200 million for the research vessel to engage with the public um, no the, the business case for the vessel was primarily around the science need and on a value for money case. It wasn't a proposal, it wasn't justified at all in terms of public, public engagement. Right, and, and it, what else are you, are you going to do, to, so, well, if indeed you can do anything else, to, with public engagement on, on its work? I, I would say that our Royal Charter that NERC operates under places an obligation for us to do public engagement work. Right. So it was always our intention that as part of this ship activity we would have a communications and engagement plan to reach out to wider audiences. Um, the success of this stage having been somewhat livelier than we expected, we'll probably be relooking at those plans. So in addition to working with Biz on the Polo Exploration Programme, we will be looking at launching our own new public engagement strategy this year, um, which has uh, three strands to it. One around inspiring and informing public about the science we do. One about engaging them in discussion and debate on contemporary issues. And one on dialogue about the actual decisions and funding routes we take in NERC. Fine. The, um, NERC itself obviously has... Uh strict uh, guidelines, not more than guidelines, instructions on those to whom it grants funds to engage in, uh, to undertake public engagement. Um, how is that engagement monitored and how is its success measured or not? So I think, first of all, um, just, to, just to follow up what Julia is remarking upon, I think NERC Council did have a discussion towards the end of the last year as to whether we were sufficiently strategic in our approach to public engagement. And, that, and, and in particular, actually, to pick up on something James was saying about whether we are as effective as we could be in informing the discussions around 
somewhat more tricky areas environmental science so it's easy to list them just straight off uh, fracking for example or near nicotinoids or something and I think our view was that we weren't doing enough in a strategic kind of way and in particular we were probably relying too much on pathways to impact in which quite often public engagement features uh, as an activity and too reliant on what I might describe as a large number of small investments. So Julia remarked on the need for us to generate a, a public engagement strategy. What, what I would add to that is that the Council also agreed in March to create a specific funding line of some 500,000 a year in order to take this particularly this question of, of what I might describe as contested areas of environmental science and informing them more seriously and being able to do it, I would remark, in a more strategic way. Many of the investments that we have been making, and this is true actually of the science as much as it is true of the public engagement element, which is a, it is a general requirement on organisations we give it to, are of themselves very small and primarily we, regard, we rely on what I might describe as our primary auditing functions to ensure that organisations that we grant to do indeed use the money in an appropriate way. Um, the, but as I say, I think the, the, at the strategic level, I think that NERC has decided it's essentially got to up its game. Not, not, it's not so much a question of the total expenditure. I mean, clearly all of our institutes also have significant public engagement activity. But I think as a council, we did feel that we needed to take a more strategic approach to it. Do the proposals by any particular applicant for, for grant funding um, of their intentions for public engagement in, in, in the project, is that taken into account before deciding on the allocation of funding? If uh, in our um, ordinary uh, grant lines, that's to say that the competitive grant lines, the funding decisions themselves are made on scientific grounds. If the, if the science view is that the money, that they should be funded, we then seek a proper pathways to impacts case. It's a condition of being awarded the money, but it's not a criteria in the scientific evaluation as to who gets it. Now, uh, it, depending on the subject matter of the grant, the public engagement element may be larger or smaller. It depends on the extent to which the specific science lends itself to public engagement. So, so the primary consideration is the scientific merit or potential yes. of the project. For, for our competitive science. But then it's a secondary consideration as to how that can be best communicated to the public in the way that their money is being used. Yes. Yeah. Right, okay. And uh, do you have a, a strategy uh, or plan, whatever it might be, for um, fostering public engagement uh, with science and for sharing best practice in doing this amongst your institutes? Um, I think or, is it, or is it just as and when? I think in the terms that you're describing, the honest answer would probably be no, which is why we have decided to take, to, to, to A, give this specific funding attention and B, to create a specific strategy associated with it. Having said that, I wouldn't want to um, downplay the very significant activities that does happen in our institutes around public engagement. They all run, for example, open days, which are often very effective, at least in their locality, of bringing the activities to their, to their attention. But I think we, we are aware of the need to look at this in a more top-down and strategic way. Finally, a question not related to any of the ones I've previously asked, but have I misunderstood it? Or does there seem to be a disproportionate amount of effort put into the Antarctic rather than the Arctic? There is uh, uh, very clearly a uh, wider UK interest in maintaining the level of activity in the Antarctic. And um, that issue, I have to say, did get difficult some years ago primarily because of the inflationary cost of maintaining the bases was being placed on the remainder of the uh, NERC science budget. Now in the end, the resolution to that question was to introduce partition for the Antarctic logistics and infrastructure. 
And I must say that, that it's been good to see that work very effectively in this spending review process so that the inflationary element of the Antarctic basis, and there is some, has not been tensioned across the rest of the environmental science budget. On the other hand, if one takes a look at the amount we are spending on science in the north and south, as opposed to maintaining the logistic capability, the answer is that that is in fact about 50-50. And we have maintained for some years now, and now recently renewed, the levels of strategic funding into the Arctic, because we recognise that there is very considerable change going on there, and straightforwardly, the Arctic is closer to us than the Antarctic. So, but in science budgetary terms, I would say it is about 50-50. Thank you. Graham Stringer. Just, just, I wasn't going to answer this question, but you uh, mentioned near nicotinoids in your answer in terms of engaging the public. All MPs at the moment, I guess, are swamped uh, with emails from people concerned about the impact of uh, neonicotinoids on bees and other pollinators. It seems to me that the the emails we're getting, sort of stimulated by 38 Degrees and Friends of the Earth, are a long way from the science as, as we know it. What, what have you done in actual fact to engage people with that science? Um, well, I think first um, one of our institutes, Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, is, is indeed embarked on quite extensive work to try and produce more objective scientific information and that is being done with a uh, public engagement strategy in place. Um, but if I come back to, to James's remark and the remarks I was making earlier, I think NERC hasn't been as effective as it ought to be and could be in trying to put in place funding mechanisms to, to, to inform the public in these issues in a way that perhaps it, it could do uh, more effectively. I think NERC in the past has tended to focus its public engagement activities on the interest and wonder of the natural world. We've had a, a, uh, a journal called Planet Earth very effectively run for many years now. So I, I think that we, we have had other uh, uh, engagements um, James mentioned, for example, with geoengineering, which was quite effective. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, I think we can we can do better precisely to try and address your Are question. You actually doing anything, because this is a major policy issue in which decisions at a European level have been made, decisions at a UK level are being made, and it, it feels like the GM debate where... Uh, Frankenstein Foods win the argument against the, the solid science. So what are you actually doing? Well, I think what we are looking at now is to ask ourselves what, what, is, what, what things should we put in place, bearing in mind we would do this not because we would do it, but because we would give funding to others to achieve it, in order to inform the public debate. With it, but, but at the same time, Research Council activity has to somehow fall short of telling people what the answers are. So it's not our role to determine policy, it's our role to fund things that inform policy. Now, there are various ways in which one may approach a thing like that. One could create a specific unit of people with a specific remit to provide... Are you actually doing anything? Sorry? Are you actually doing anything at the moment? I know there are different ways that one could approach it. But, but how are you getting the science that's done out there to, to, to people at the moment? How, how are you answering the question you ask yourself? Your job is to present the facts to policymakers so that they can make decisions. How are you actually doing that on, in, in this issue? I would say that in terms of engaging the public with those facts, as Duncan says, we have a way to go and we are not really doing that at the moment. But what we have been doing is engaging the policy makers and via communications channels media. So we have had media briefings on the science of neonicotinoids and the experiments that are conducted to determine whether they're affecting bees and pollinators and how. So we work with the media audiences. 
and we worked with some representatives from the House of Commons Library to make sure that they had accurate briefing information and the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, which Duncan mentioned, has just published a new book on bees and pollinators and how to maintain safe habitats for them that they're distributing free to farmers and other landowners. So we are working with those groups to get the evidence out there, but on the public side, this part of our ambition to actually change and do more there. Right, thanks, that's, that's clear. Can we move back to the ships? Uh, why was a new boat ship needed? as opposed to upgrading the existing ships in the fleet? Well, the existing ships are ageing. So if we, if we kept them, we, were, we would be looking at an increasing maintenance cost. So this, beca- this was fairly apparent some years ago. So we simply we, we looked at this question of, was it better value for money to continue with a two-ship operation given the age and increasing maintenance costs or move to a new single ship which has both the science capability and the cargo capability. We looked at that in a net present value methodology and we came to the conclusion that a new single ship was over the next 25 years, the best way forwards in terms of providing both the science and the cargo capability that we need to maintain in the north and south, our science and our bases. Do, do I understand from that that one or more of the, the current fleet will be scrapped? Well, whether it will be scrapped or not... Is not well, it will not be doing the work it was doing before. That's the aim, yes, from 2019. Yes. Right. What science and research will the the new ship be able to do that either couldn't be done before or wasn't being done before? Well, I think in the first instance, its its aim is to sustain the science that we do. I mean, there there are clearly very large-scale changes going on in the Antarctic ice sheet, which is driven by marine processes, and nobody, I don't think any of us need to I mean, it is not necessary for me to emphasise the rate of change in the Arctic and observe that mechanisms of propagation of climate change are as important in the ocean as they are in the atmosphere. And, and, and in addition to that, ocean acidification is likely to affect the polar oceans more rapidly and more, more rapidly into greater depth than the tropical oceans in the first instance. So the need to maintain our capability to do science in the polar oceans just you, when, if anything over the years this has got stronger rather than weaker so in the first instance what we're looking at is to be able to sustain our science and its quality and the UK are big players in both the oceans and in the poles both sides we are in it's on that point I'm sorry to interrupt where are we in the pecking order sort of internationally in terms of polar science? Um, If one simply looks at quality, we can make a fair pitch to be in first place. We cannot, of course, compete in volume uh, with the US. Where would we be if we did the pecking order in terms of quantity? In terms of volume, yes. Oh, I would think we are probably. I don't actually know off the top of my head. We could provide you with the data, but my guess would be possibly fifth, just in terms of volume. For example, the German polar effort is very substantially larger than ours. Just to illustrate the, the point. And what would we have to do to move up the pecking order to be second or first? <laughs> um, well, I guess the answer to that is fairly obvious. Um, well, it is. I'm looking for, I'm looking for a figure. Um, oh, a figure? Yeah. Well, you pr- I mean, we are roughly, I suppose, so just uh, we're looking at, in total, our, our polar activities maybe of the order of 60 million a year, all told. That's the, so that's the infrastructure as well as the science that we fund on top. You probably have to double it. Right. Um, I'm a uh, chief executive of NERC, so I'm not going to strongly argue that because of course we have to tension that kind of decision across the rest of our portfolio. And a last question if I, I, I may. Where, how many ships, boats will there be in the fleet in 10 years time and who will they be owned by? 
So that is a that's in my view a very interesting question. I I um, personally think that if one looks, I don't know about ten, but if one looks certainly twenty years into the future, I don't think that we will have the same degree of reliance on ships as the main platform to explore the oceans. That is a different statement from having no reliance, but we are going to move in a big way to automated submersibles in order to explore the ocean, and we can already see that. I would say that NERC, and particularly its National Oceanography Centre, is something of a world leader in this. We have the biggest fleet now of automated submersibles in Europe. That includes all military capability, and we are investing it. We've just taken another decision to continue to invest capital into the growth of range, depth, and measurement capability. I personally will be surprised. We have presently uh, um, three scientific vessels, and the fourth one is cargo. We're close to three. I will be present. I'd be surprised if in 15 years' time we will, we will be much more than one, because I, you can see already that ships have been the workhorses of exploring the oceans now for hundreds of years. But there are many challenges in the oceans, which, which, and particularly the deep oceans, which ships cannot address. We need greater depth, greater range, and greater ability to survey large areas. And who will own that ship? Who will own it? Yeah. Well, I mean, if they're, if they're scientific ships, my view is that the ownership will have to remain in the public sector because I, it's very hard for me to see anybody else wanting the risk on a ship, which is very substantial. Um, but as we move to smaller, more varied ways of exploring in the ocean, one could foresee a different kind of arrangement. I mean, there may be other interests with, uh, and the costs coming down, there may be a much wider group of people who'd be interested in exploring the ocean. I mean, given that we're talking 15 years away, it's a little bit difficult to see, but the, the direction of travel is very clear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Carol Monaghan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I put out a tweet at the start of this meeting saying that we were discussing science engagement, and I have had a response from SEMTA who are saying, would be great if interest in Boaty McBoatface meant a new generation of curious minds turning on to science. Now, We've already, you've already mentioned public engagement. You've um, had a question regarding uh, lesson plans for teachers. I'm really wondering specifically about children, possibly secondary age, who are looking at subject choices. What, what can be done with them? What can we do rather than just put out the, the competition of the boat and leave it at that. What can we do off the back of that to further engage these children? But in addition to the the base program, the pearl exploration program, which is still being scoped, so you know there's a lot of opportunity within that. And um, we've had contact from a lot of people who are interested in producing high quality children's books and other ways of engaging young people. But I think as part of our ongoing strategy, we're trying to humanise a lot of public engagement with science and explain, for careers terms, just how many ways there are into science and why it is open to everybody. So one of my um, aspirations is to increase the understanding of the people who are in science of the role they have as a model for others, um, referring to last year's Aspires report and the concept of science capital, that actually for young people to be able to connect to somebody they know or understand in terms of science makes it actually something they're much more likely to engage further with. And is there the possibility of a specific person being allocated to a school to work with young people in schools so that there's a direct contact? You talk about somebody they know. I mean, surely we have enough scientists that we can actually have that direct contact. So I believe that's something we'll be looking at in the Polar Exploration Programme. Um, the delivery partner for that is likely to be STEM Learning, who are taking over the STEM Ambassador Scheme. So that sort of activity would be something we'd look at. Okay. Okay. Um, Professor Wilson, you mentioned ScienceWise and BIS funded ScienceWise until quite recently to increase public dialogue. 
into science policy decision making. Um, what benefits and expertise did that bring and what's been lost by the lack of funding now? Well, first and foremost, I mean, I, 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 the, the cycle of science-wise came to an end, um, you know, with, with the, the end of the last spending review, but I, I understand it's still under discussion, the form that it will take uh, in this next period, so it's not, it's not uh, over, um, although I'm sure there are discussions uh, ongoing in, in business and elsewhere about how it's uh, uh, operated most effectively. Um, I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 the good thing about science-wise was that we had over a sustained period a lot of uh, experimentation in different ways of doing this stuff, and gradually we built up an accumulated body of uh, expertise, knowledge, experience in ways of doing dialogue, participation more effectively. Uh, a lot of what ScienceWise uh, did and hopefully will continue to do is fairly small scale in terms of the numbers of people being engaged. We're not talking about the, the vast hordes who are, are you know, uh, voting on the name of, of, of the ship. Um, but it's a different sort of engagement and you're trying to pull in a different sort of uh, social intelligence, if you like, into the decision process. And I mean, this goes a bit to, to, to Graham Stringer's question as well about uh, neonicotinoids. I think you know when when you're in the heat of a of a controversy, whether over GM crops or, or bees or badgers or fracking, whatever it might be, and, and you as MPs are being bombarded, you know, every hour with you know emails generated by all these different different websites, it you know that's a very difficult point at which to have the kind of thoughtful dialogue we're talking about here. Um, although there are things, of course, that the science community can and should do to help communicate uh, the underlying evidence in those uh, in those difficult debates. Um, but, you know, if you look at the research system, what you're talking about is building in the capacity to look ahead, to think, to anticipate, and to engage the public in an ongoing discussion about possible directions, possible implications of a whole host of things that we're investing in as a nation across different scientific domains, across different technological domains. And it seems to me that that's a very proper element of a good, functioning, healthy, uh, and, and democratic science innovation system. Um, and it's that, as I say, that I hope gets due emphasis in discussions that are now underway around uh, reform of the research system. Uh, I mean, to give a, another concrete example, uh, if you think about the vote uh, that, that, that you had here uh, 18 months, two years ago, on, on mitochondrial transfer, um, in the lead up to that, there were lots of activities that went on, things that the MRC did, things that the Wellcome Trust did. Um, earlier on, ScienceWise had run a whole host of more in-depth uh, deliberative processes. I think they'd involved around 3,000 people in a series of uh, workshops, meetings, to really tease out what's at stake in that debate. What is it that people get uh, worried about? What are the kind of ethical uh, uh, issues that concerned them? And so when we got to the point that there was a, you know, that there was going to be a vote here, and, and obviously it was being discussed in, in the mainstream media, it was possible to point to that work, not, not as a representative exercise, it's not a vote, but it gives you a depth of understanding about the text to the nature of public concern and I think improves the overall legitimacy of the decisions that are being made whether that's policy decisions regulatory decisions you know in, in respect of uh, reproductive technologies or, uh, or earlier on upstream in this process the, the funding decisions that the councils are making so so I hope that as you say science wise is maintained and that the role of that kind of dialogue uh, is is re-emphasized in the in the Reorganised research council system that's coming. Do you do you see that it will affect the research council's ability to engage properly? This, this if the funding is not renewed. Uh, well, I I I, I, th I think it would be a great shame if it, if it weren't renewed in some way, shape, or form. And as I say, I, I believe uh, the intention is that it that it will be. Um, I very much welcome the kind of things that, that Duncan has said about the plans that NERC has to develop a more strategic approach to uh, its public engagement activities. Um, you know, as I say, I, th I think that's something all the councils should be doing. But also at a time where we've got these new kind of meta structures being created through the nurse review at, at the Research UK level, um, and plans obviously to bring a lot of generic communications and other functions up to that level, there's also a need to think a bit more strategically across the piece about how we do public dialogue in the research system. Um, there's also a related debate about the impact agenda as it's 
played out in the research excellence framework. I mean, Lord Stern is currently reviewing that. There's things that could be done there to think about the kind of incentive structures we have in place for researchers, scientists, academics uh, to do public engagement, to do it well, and to be properly recognised and rewarded for that in their uh, in their academic career. Because you know, if those structures are wrong, then however uh, you know well-meaning the strategies and stuff are, people won't do this stuff. Uh, because they're under pressure to do many, many, many other things. So, you know, we need to we need to think about this um, at that strategic level and just try and make sure that uh, uh, there's proper uh, thought that goes into structures, to budgets, and to uh, the policies around around public dialogue. And, and finally, Stella's already asked questions about the the different levels of public engagement. Um, to what extent do you, do you feel that the government incorporate public dialogue rather than simple simple engagement exercises, but real depth of dialogue into their policy decision making? And that's probably generally to the panel. I'm not sure that, that the question as you posed it is one that the head of research council particularly should be answering if I take the view that we're not government, if you see what I mean. But I think that if one places that question in the um, scientific domain, I think it's a fair question in some ways, and let me illustrate that. There is, certainly we are considering what, as a council, we, we should be funding to inform generally ourselves scientifically about what the environmental impact of fracking might be. And I think that that to do it would require us to uh, take measurements, have people moving around the environment uh, in areas where people are at least considering the possibility of, of doing fracking. I think that we would absolutely want to engage and indeed already are in some respects, with local authorities, parish councils, individual people, very early on in such a process in order to engage them in their concerns so we can address, maybe scientifically speaking, what those concerns are, and, and also to, so, so to give them the feeling that part of our activity is on their behalf. So I, I certainly think there are areas, and particularly in these contested areas, where we could do more than we have done in the past, although not... I, for example, I thought the BBSRC activity around GM crops recently was reasonably well handled. I think the earlier geoengineering activity was well handled. But I think we could do more to get that kind of public dialogue into our process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Matt Warman. Thank you. We, we've strayed a little way away from... Uh, Boti, so if we could get things back on an even keel. Uh, I wonder if um, it seems to me that now you've got this amazing brand actually but Boti, Boti is more than just the, the ship and it's more than the submarine so I sort of wonder what you're going to do. You, have you thought about whether this is more than the ship and have you thought about how you're going to capitalise in the sort of long-term process that we're going to see because obviously uh, the ship is going to be around for a long time so I, I guess sort of partly have you thought about what that's what that's going to do um, and partly what's the next thing we're going to hear from from Boti practically well I think as I said as I've said before I think we're just really starting to think seriously about what is the answer to your exactly mm. to your question because we we have been busy, I should say, with the here and now. Uh, it's been all hands on but, deck. But, yeah, well, <laughs> to some, some extent, yes. But your question, it seems to me, is, is the obvious one. And it is why we wanted to keep, first of all, our reputation for a sense of humour, but it's also why we wanted to keep the name alive and associate mm -hmm. with, yeah. with a thing. And as I say, I think that there are many ways we can reuse that. That, that the submarines themselves will have many adventures. We have lost one on an occasion. We had to organise a rescue, actually using uh, an oil uh, remote operated vehicle to hook it out because it got a bit confused about where it was. 
there are many ways and with modern technology there are many ways we can make that video stream there are many ways of thinking about how we can go on using that name I, I have to say that straight off the top of my head I don't think we quite got to the bottom of some IPR issues around this name but again if we go back to this question of schools this is, this is, Interacting directly with schools isn't a primary function of research councils, and, and, but if we can work particularly with this money that the Minister announced recently, we may be able to use this very, very, very effectively. It, 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 uh, as you may have seen, there was a very excellent Horizon programme on the poll, uh, polls just, just last week, and we, we are many ways that which are always attractive to people. And I think there are just many ways we can think about how to continue with this engagement. The, the issue about, you know, is this just trivial or not? The, 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 I think what this has done is it's put in many, many people's minds the existence of an object called NERC, which I don't think they knew about before, and to some extent its role. And that won't go away that quickly. That will be around in their memories. And if we can continue to engage with that, as maybe some of these youngsters get older, in broadening out people's interest, then we will have achieved a long-term success from what right now has been a short-term success. Thank you. Victoria Gorick. Thank you. Well, sort of just to take that on, because I think we're very uh, passionate here about making the most of it and building forward. Um, Professor Wilson, I think you are editor of the Science Guardian Science... Science Policy Board, yes. Yes, yes. 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 I mean... What do you think about um, how science is reported? Is it, do you think it's accurate? Do you think it's impartial? Do you think it's exciting? You know, let's have a benefit of your experience on that. Sure. I mean, I, mean, I, I obviously don't speak for the, for the Guardian uh, corporately. I, the fact that the Guardian uh, has so many uh, researchers, scientists, academics, I'm a, I'm a social scientist obviously blogging for it, is in part a reflection of this very diverse... Mm. Um, science communication ecosystem that we now inhabit, which I think is a, is a very good thing. Um, uh, and it's certainly been a way uh, through which that organisation and a number of other big media organisations have been able to increase the, the depth and, and uh, range of their uh, science coverage. Um, I mean, I think overall in, in the UK we have an incredibly uh, dynamic and high-quality science media I think um, uh, and, it, and it's by and large uh, grown in uh, quality uh, over, over background How, I mean the public obviously would presume things are sort of accurate and checked and researched do you think there's an accurate way of people finding out things that are going on so it's an impartial way I mean tell us how you feel that it imparts the information to the public yes I mean I, th I think obviously in, in you know this day and age, the, the range of sources through which people access information is much more uh, plural than, than it was. Um, but you've still got, I think, very high quality science coverage uh, through the BBC and, and indeed the other uh, main television channels. Um, I think our print media is is very strong. I mean, your your counterpart uh, counterparts in the House of Lords were, were, I think, unhappy about some of the climate coverage in the Times over recent uh, months and years but by and large the, the um, uh, yeah I think the, the science correspondents the science experts that we have in our leading media organisations have uh, you know continue to do a very good job and you know certainly if you compare the UK's science media scene with um, you know comparator countries it, 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 it uh, performs very strongly I think in the sense um, of it's impartial or it's, re it's scientifically related? Or yeah, I think by and large an effort on the part of media organisations and individual journalists to try and um, get to the facts of the story to present them clearly. Uh, I think also the range and, and richness of, of different media channels uh, is, is uh, probably unrivaled in terms of the size of the country relative to, the, to that science media scene. Um, so, uh, so yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I think in terms of the science communication landscape, I don't, I don't see media coverage of science as, you know, the sort of most problematic part of it in a way. 
Uh, there's obviously all, always more that can be done. Um, there are specific issues that pertain to things like climate change and its discussion in the media. But um, by and large, I think it's, it's a, a positive. And I think also organisations like the Science Media Centre, who I think are, are here in some of the back of the room, have, have played a very positive role in uh, bringing experts together very quickly to provide an informed, evidence-based, uh, authoritative voice on uh, key developments in science or scientific controversies as they arise. Um, I mean, the chairman led a group this morning at the Royal Society, and we were talking a lot of technical points, but this also then came on about the government's responsibilities to communicate policy, policy relevant scientific um, issues to the public and how that could be done because obviously the conversation at the moment is about this and how we can take it forward which is very exciting but inevitably as you touched on earlier there are a whole range of quite important things and in a very competitive debate like being in parliament you know do you discuss the, the, the personal crises in life or do you discuss the importance of science and what, and what it can do what do you think the government's responsibility is in communicating policy-led scientific issues to the public and the ways of doing that? Well, this brings us back to what um, mechanisms are in place within the broader science system to, to ensure that this kind of activity happens. Um, we've talked about ScienceWise, which is one practical example. Um, there's been, over recent years, a, a national centre for the coordination of public engagement. Um, we've had individual universities who've been uh, selected as beacons of public engagement. These are all different government schemes. Um, and then there are the things that the research councils individually and collectively has, have done in, in this area. So, I mean, all of that is essentially uh, uh, underpinned by uh, government support and by public funding. Um, and, and uh, you know, in that sense, I think, um, taken in, in totality, there, there's a, a good amount of activity going on. You've then got the role of the government chief scientific advisor, Sir Mark Wolper, and his counterparts in different departments. And he also obviously has a, a, a particular responsibility um, as a spokesperson for the collective enterprise of science, uh, a similar role perhaps pertaining to the president of the Royal Society. Um, so, uh, you know, you've got these leaders, you've got people then like Brian Cox, Alice Roberts, these sort of media figures for science. Uh, they're all important parts of the, of the system. Um, you know, go back to my earlier point, I think the one thing that w it would be good to see is perhaps a, a bit more uh, ambition and leadership at the government level of this agenda, which um, perhaps we haven't seen. It. Or of the science? Of the importance of communicating science and, and undertaking dialogue around science. I mean, I don't think anyone would be expecting uh, Joe Johnson or, or anyone to be, uh, you know, conducting the detail of a, of a science communication exercise on, on mm. polar research or, or neonicotinoids or anything else. Um, but clearly, um, political leadership of this agenda is important. Um, and, you know, going back a bit uh, uh, to, to earlier times, um, you know, I'm, I, for me, the, the last really significant uh, attempt to kind of it, capture this stuff in, 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 a, in a major policy document uh, takes you right back to the 10 year framework uh, uh, produced by the Treasury under Gordon Brown, which. which had a very substantial discussion of science and society, this was in 2004, off the back of GM and all the associated debates. And, you know, you, you, again, I'd, I'd encourage Just the committee to... Just following on from to, that, you don't think the media sometimes sensationalises science then? I mean, do you think that we're putting it... Uh, of, of course, there are, there are examples of, of debates that get sensationalised. But I think the other thing that we have now is a very good sort of rapid response mechanism in those circumstances, and this is enabled partly mm. by social media. So... To take a specific example, um, uh, Baroness Greenfield has been known uh, at times to make statements about the internet and its effect on, on uh, you know, the, the, the brain development of, of children or whatever in, in ways that is not uh, very uh, substantiated by the science. And when those kind of statements are made, you'll get a very, very rapid and vociferous response from the science community expressed through social media, blogging, articles in mm. newspapers saying, you know, this is overstepping the mark, it's, it's way off beam with where the science actually lies. So that, that, there's a kind of speed with which mm. uh, inaccurate information is corrected. That doesn't, of course, remove ideological debate in areas where there are other things going on, like climate. I mean, there's a lot more going on in the climate debate than just the science. Um, so... 
Uh, but, but, you know, I think by and large, um, things in this country at least aren't, aren't, aren't that bad. Thank you, that's very helpful. Okay, and with the last question, Stella? I, I just wanted to follow up on this because I, I understand what you're saying about social media. Obviously, a lot of our knowledge about how to engage people in scientific uh, discussions and policy making, your own work, the work on GM foods, the Frankenstein foods debate, was of an era when we didn't have quite as much social media engagement. And if we look at trends about public confidence in institutions to tell them the truth, uh, or more practically, I'm sure all of us have had emails about chemtrails and people bringing this up. And, and, and actually, one of the things I just wanted to be interested to get your views on, look, we've talked a lot about participation and engagement, how we get more people involved. At a time when people's trust and confidence in traditional public institutions and their ability to communicate trusted information is being questioned and there's never more information out there, how do we square that circle? Because there are lots of debates, lots of difficult issues coming towards us, whether it is around bees, whether it's around fracking, whether it's around the science of, of renewable energy, that people knowing what the science is, is is only the start of people thinking, actually, you're telling me this, but what's your agenda? And, and chemtrails to me seems a particularly good example of this, where there have been public statements about what it is, and I will regularly get from people, ah, oh, yes, but you know, the government would say that. Mm-hmm. So in a different environment and an evolving environment about lots of information but lots of scepticism, where's the future for science engagement? Yes, and I mean, you're quite right. I mean, the, and these are bigger shifts in the yeah. broader cultural communication democratic landscape than, than, than purely uh, you know, covered by science. I mean, I think for scientific institutions, the only uh, response to those dynamics is uh, one of uh, greater openness and transparency and, and an honesty about areas of uncertainty, about dilemmas where they exist, uh, about the fact that you know, we as scientists, as researchers, don't have uh, all the answers in some of these domains. We obviously have to do our best to communicate uh, the evidence where it exists, but also to be honest uh, about dilemmas. And in that way, when you come to a kind of particular issue where there's a, a controversy or, or you know, a sort of conspiracy theory, if you like, uh, there will be that established uh, existing body of, of confidence and trust in scientific institutions, which, I mean, if you go, you know, if you take the, the, the surveys that are done, uh, I mean, remember that trust overall in scientists and in particularly publicly funded scientists is very, very high. I mean, it's, it's you know, far higher than, than trust in, so in if, many if, other sectors. If we could just anchor it in the conversations about Facebook, but he started it, um, <laughs> where you haven't necessarily got a controversy about what, what they're doing per se, but it is an opportunity to have a conversation about what science can and can't tell you, what risks it can mm. and can't reveal what your confidence ratios are, so that all the, the unknowns that perhaps we do need to have those conversations about, what, do you, what would your advice be sort of for going forward on this project? Well, I, I think clearly the scale of public interest in this has, mm. has I think, quite uh, reasonably taken NERC somewhat by surprise. It's going to take them a bit of time to work out how they make the most of it. Um, I, I think, you know, as we've heard here, and, and I would agree, it would be uh, crazy not to try and build on this in terms of engagement with schools and young people, uh, in terms of some ongoing media work. Um, and I hope, as we've heard from, from colleagues at NERC, um, using this also as the trigger for a, a, a revisiting of that broader public engagement strategy for the Research Council that encompasses the different levels of uh, uh, communication, dialogue, participation that, that you were describing earlier. Do you think voting at both face can solve the problem of chemtrails then? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, chem, chemtrails is a tricky... I mean, I, I was director of policy of the Royal Society. That's not too deeply into no. chemtrails, if that's OK. We, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a... But, I mean, the work they did on geoengineering, when I was at the Royal Society, we, we did a big study on geoengineering. I mean, it's in and around that debate you get a lot of the chemtrails... Discussion. Yeah, my it's, comment would be it's a maybe, difficult one. Um, we are all, and I hope will continue to be children of the Enlightenment, and the the uh, and if one can get people early and demonstrate to them the seriousness and the purpose of how science goes about doing its business, then there's a chance that we'll all continue to be contrails. Perhaps a question which seems to attract a rather diverse set of people, but. If we can just 
continue to, te to, to demonstrate to youngsters what science can do and the integrity with which it's done and the seriousness with which it's done, then maybe we can continue to trust it. Thank you very much. Um, can I thank um, the panel for the time that they've taken today? Given that this is a science communication inquiry, I'm very glad that we got a chance to talk about the science as well as the communication. Um, and I was very pleased that we um, got to talk a little bit about the importance of polar research um, at the moment and the role that um, David Attenborough will play in making sure that the UK um, retains its number one spot in terms of quality and we can have a discussion about getting up to number one in terms of volume perhaps at a later date. Um, but you know this, this what, what, what my colleague has called the Boaty brand has sort of fallen mm -hmm. into your lap as a gift really. And I don't think that we're going to be um, the only uh, people who will look to NERC um, to set the example on how to capture that extraordinary level of awareness and leverage it um, not just as a long-term interest in science but also as a much deeper participation for when we are as a nation going to have to make what we know will be some really challenging and difficult ethical decisions. Um, so without putting too much pressure on you, all eyes are on you. Um, and so um, we are um, watching with bated breath. But I'm very concerned to hear that you lost one of your submersibles. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the committee will be absolutely dismayed if you lose Boaty. Mm -hmm. And we will have you back before us. <laughs> well, before maybe, you but we'll, we, all we would have is son of Boaty. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <laughs> 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 All right, well, order, order. That brings this session to an end. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.